Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on uh, today for uh, during Veterans Day. And just like to start off by thanking anyone that has served for your service. Um, we are going to get started here with our webinar. And once this, yep, there we go. All right. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us for our Community Microgrid Assistance Partnership Overview Webinar. Um, this program, also known as CMAP. And my name is Sean Esterly. Uh, kicking things off here, I'm a project manager with NREL and helping to support the CMAP program. A couple of housekeeping items for you as we go to the next slide. Um, so uh, just some Zoom tips for you. If you're having any trouble uh, hearing anything, uh, make sure you check your audio settings first. Uh, if you're having any connectivity issues, you can always try a different browser. You can try quickly logging out and back in um, or feel free to send a chat uh, to us and we can try to walk you through how to fix that. Um, you'll notice at the bottom, you have two options for interacting with us. There is a chat feature. That's gonna be for any dis uh, directions, like how to fix audio if you're having issues and any discussion. Um, we do have a separate Q&A panel and would ask that if you have any questions you'd like to submit to us, please use that Q&A panel. We're going to be monitoring that very uh, closely and we'll address those questions during the Q&A session. Um, as you join, please feel free to enter your name, location and organization into the chat. Love to hear um, who's joining, where you're joining from, and, and who you're representing. Um, also, if uh, there is a full link for the request for proposals or RFPs on the CMAP website, um, we will be dropping that link into the chat for everybody. So you can click on that to access that web page. Uh, we will also be copying all questions that do accidentally find their way into the chat, into the Q&A. Um, so uh, we will release that with the recording as well. So you'll be able to go back, see what questions were asked and how we responded to those. And so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Ian uh, Baringgold, my colleague here for the next uh, few slides. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here. I uh, want to give a, a quick introduction to the to the program. Uh, Dan Tan was, was going to be able to do this, but was called away. And so I'm filling in for him. So we'll do a quick overview of, uh, of kind of the, the CMAP effort, what we're doing. We'll dive into the program a little bit to, to give you an overview of the program. And then uh, uh, Sean will be back to dive a little bit more into the specific solicitation that's on the street. Um, and then Kendall at the end, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, about the the actual contracting, the application process, and some things to think about as you're looking at um, pulling together a solicitation. So really quickly, uh, for all of you, this will not be a, a kind of any new information. Um, communities, isolated communities uh, in in all all over the United States, but uh, certainly in Alaska, Hawaii, uh, the, the Southwest, Midwest, islands along the East Coast, uh, any place where you're not connected to the grid or connected through a very tenuous grid, the energy costs are amazingly high. And so part of the microgrids effort within the Department of Energy under the Office of Electricity is really look at, at how we can improve microgrid systems, especially for islanded and remote communities. And that's really the the, the big focus of this larger CMAP effort. Going to the next slide, please. And one of the things that, that CMAP is really trying to, to kind of get into is, is trying to address is that we've had very uh, piecemeal deployment uh, of microgrid technology over the years. There's a number of systems that have been operating for, well, certainly diesel power systems have been operating, uh, microgrid diesel systems have been operating for, um, for the better part of 50 years in a lot of places. Um, and there are a lot of innovations in regards to how diesel plants can operate. A lot of innovation has happened with putting renewables, uh, energy storage, uh, advanced controls on, on diesel plants to increase the efficiency. But the communication from community to community about how to do this effectively so that all of the communities can move forwards in this development process 
uh, hasn't really happened. And then you have programs like in Alaska, where the Alaska Energy Authority in the state of Alaska has put a lot of effort into kind of expanding knowledge within uh, the Alaskan community on how to improve microgrid power systems. That doesn't necessarily translate very well, and the communication doesn't get out to places outside of Alaska. So the whole CMAP effort, um, this Community Microgrid Assistance Partnership, is really built around how do we take the lessons that, that are being learned by the deployment of renewable technology, advanced uh, diesel technology, um, advanced controls, uh, to be able to move all communities forward, not just the one that gets the grant. And so that's a real focus of the efforts that we're doing here. We're talking about, in this case, um, contracts going out to communities to move that along. But a whole element of this is how do we bring other communities around this community of practice so that everybody can move forwards uh, at, at, a, at a faster pace. Next slide. And really focusing on, uh, on the goals of, of the Office of Electricity Microgrid Program, you can see these are the key bullet points. So promote microgrids is a core solution. For isolated communities, you already know it is a core solution, but how do we improve resilience, reliability of that system? And then how can we take lessons from, from what all of you are doing and apply it not only to other isolated communities in the United States, in the Arctic, around the world, but how do we take the, that learning and apply it to the grid system writ large um, as we face climate change and, and climate disruption? Um, uh, second bullet there is, is really working to decarbonize the uh, electricity system. And so that is how do we run our system more efficiently? And a lot of expertise within the microgrid and, and the islanded remote area on how you operate power systems more efficiently. So how can we take that learning and apply it uh, nationally? And then decreasing the costs. So all of these things are core elements of the Office of Electricity program. And you can see how they reflect very um, cleanly into the work that we're trying to do here, but the work in, in islanded and remote communities as well. Next slide. And so I'm going to dive a little bit into this Community Microgrid Assistance Partnership. Uh, and, and again, it is a partnership. So we have a number of different things that we're going to be talking through, one of which is the solicitation that's on the street right now. Next slide. So the, the partnership is what it, what it I mean, the name uh, gives you an indication of what we're trying to do. So there are a lot of entities out here uh, that are working to, to move forward microgrid power systems. Um, and microgrid power systems, uh, if successful, have a strong impact in communities. That's what everybody is trying to do. And so how do we pull these entities together into a real partnership? where we can expand communication and learning across all of them. And that's really what the focus of the Office of Electricity is trying to do through this CMAP activity. So pulling all of these entities that are working in the space uh, to, to show real outcomes in isolated and remote communities. Next slide. And we really see this um, through this kind of three strong uh, pillars of activities. Um, so a partnership of organizations, and that's uh, the Department of Energy, National Laboratories, state energy offices, academia uh, in, in the kind of areas of, um, of the country that we're talking about. So uh, academia, uh, academic programs in Alaska, Hawaii, uh, NGOs, so non-governmental organizations that are already working in communities but have, have a lot of expertise. Um, in kind of tribal energy, tribal development. Uh, how do we pull all of these people together, all of these organizations together, each of which are, are doing a little bit of this um, to have a, a kind of a cohesive element uh, to support communities as they go forwards. The second part is this community solicitation, which is the focus of, of this talk right now. And that is providing money to communities to be able to do the development work that needs to happen um, to, to go from an idea, from a concept, we know we, we want to improve our microgrid, we have an understanding of how to do it, but then we need to get money to be able to do it. So how do we bring communities together, um, providing them money to, to have communities look at how to sol solve this problem? And then the third one is these wraparound services. So how do we provide kind of support to communities 
uh, as they go through this process. And some of this could be around, how do you write good proposals? Others are, how do you do power plant operation and maintenance? And, and these wraparound services are really trying to pull um, the information together and provide it to multiple communities so that they can, they can move the development of microgrids um, forward. Next slide. So this, this key focus of, of funding to communities is because communities need resources to be able to innovate. So all every community that I've been to, um, all are filled with amazingly smart people who have ideas of what they, they can do to make things work better, but they're not resourced to be able to do it. And so one of the key elements of this is to provide those resources to the community in, in terms of financial resources to move it forward so that you're implementing and developing the solutions for community for your community, um, but then also having uh, the ability to tap into this whole other partner network to address questions that you might have might have and might not have clear solutions to. And so this whole concept of a partnership, but being able to provide resources to communities to move uh, their plan forwards is really what we're trying to do. Next slide. And so through this, uh, through this funding effort, um, we're really looking at, at providing awards to communities to, to implement activities uh, around microgrid development. And so Sean will get into these um, uh, in, in a little bit more detail um, uh, as we go forwards. But as I said, we have four of them, two based on, on kind of regional engagement. So multiple communities that are working on similar problems or want to work on similar problems, but need resources to be able to do it. And so the first one, topic area one, is around how do we operate our power systems better? The second one is how do we um, develop systems better? So that if, if a couple of communities in a general region, and we're not trying to be specific about what region means, um, but want to develop uh, similar projects, you all have solar energy, you all have wind energy, um, and you want to think about how do we do this as a group as compared to each doing it by themselves, uh, a little bit of funding to be able to do that. The second two or the, the third and fourth are really focused more on a single microgrid, so a single community that wants to either improve their system, uh, kind of design it or come into or improve the power system under development or really do a, a large scale transformation, do something uh, a little bit more, not out of the box, but push their system a little bit more. And so the we've got these kind of uh, key principles here as you look at implementing these. Um, we want kind of organizations that are there to support you. So the universities, the NGOs, the national laboratories, if need be. Um, they need to be competitive, but the goal is to have them simple so that they're not a huge lift for communities to be able to engage around. Um, we, we want kind of specific community um, commitments with specific goals because the, the idea here is to help you move forward down the pathway and to use these resources to be able to do it. Um, and then how, the, how what you're doing in your community can translate into what other communities could be doing once they learn from, from your expertise. Next slide. So these are, are the types of, of recipients that we're looking for as part of this. And you will see this if you go to um, the solicitation, uh, you'll kind of see this through the scoring criteria that we use, um, but high impact. So we want this to be able to really move the ball forwards within your communities. Um, communities that have a lot of need to, to implement these projects. Uh, so demonstrating that by doing what you're proposing to do, you're going to be able to impact your community in a positive way. Um, good motivation. So again, we can provide the money uh, to, to move things forward, but the inspiration and the motivation uh, needs to come from the communities to be able to implement it. So certainly looking for communities that have done some work in this area and, and the, the ability to provide a little bit of funding uh, to support what you're doing going forwards really moves you uh, down that path. And then um, kind of this need for continued support. So some level of technical support to be able to, to take the next steps um, is, is something that we're gonna be looking at. 
So communities that fit into into those areas uh, are are really what we're looking for. Oh, sorry. Um, I guess I should say that that up here at the top didn't really cover that. Um, but we want uh, kind of communities or or entities that are overseeing power systems. So communities that are operating power systems or the utilities that are moving them forwards. So the local power companies, local utilities, or independent energy suppliers. Community support organizations like tribal governments can certainly apply for this um, if they provide services to the communities. Going to the next slide. The wraparound services are really designed um, to provide not only the communities that receive funding, but all other communities that are looking at microgrids to be able to move the ball forwards. And so again, we can't fund everybody um, with resources, but we can certainly open the expertise that comes out of this work open to all communities that are interested in going forwards. And this includes communities that might not be far enough along to be able to actively engage um, uh, with, with financial resources, but are interested in, in looking at how to improve their microgrid, um, want to be able to make sure that they can take part in, um, in this larger partnership structure so that they can be moving uh, the ball down the road or the court as well. Next slide. And so it really is um, this kind of uh, a structure of organizations that are really going to support communities and community representatives from uh, the Department of Energy, um, all the way on the left hand side, the national laboratories, um, to community based organization, educational partners, and then the whole laboratory network to be able to implement this. So although it's being run out of NREL, it is in, in partnership with the other uh, national laboratories uh, to be able to bring the technology uh, uh, to communities and then support community outreach and engagement, proposal development, and then as I've been talking about, the funding of this work going forwards. Next question, or sorry, next slide. And so our timeline for this project, um, right, uh, for the solicitation effort is um, kind of engaging a little bit now. The, the CMAP application is open, and the plan is that that will go through to um, kind of the end of December, right before the holidays. Uh, though certainly we would like to hear from you if if that kind of the deadline of the the twentieth of December is is a problem with communities if that's not long enough to be able to move those forwards, no guarantee that um, that we can extend the deadline. But again, we're trying to make this so um, so that it is respectful for all of you, and and if we need more time to move it forwards, then we can certainly uh, look at that. Projects announced in March. And, uh, and then going through the contracting process. So thinking about the um, April, May, or sorry, the May, June timeframe for when the contracts are in place. And then the community support or the technical assistance to the projects will launch at about that time. Next slide. So we certainly see a, a lot of benefits to communities that receive funding um, through this project. So stronger operations of the microgrids, improved capacity, uh, funding, uh, the development of funding ready proposals. So a lot of communities have ideas that they want to they want to implement, but the, the ideas are not developed to the point where they can go out and seek funding, um, whether it's private sector or public sector to deploy the projects. So really trying to get more projects from your communities to a point where they they are at a, a level of development to allow funding to be able to happen building relationships with other communities. And, and again, the real goal is to lower and stabilize energy costs for isolated communities. Um, and then we see a bunch of, of non-energy benefits as well. And going to the next slide, um, we certainly see through this kind of community of partnership that, that this, this effort goes beyond just the communities that have funding, or that get funding through this project. So please don't think about um, um, this as if, if you don't get money in this first round or you're not ready to, to apply, that you're kind of out uh, and out forever. This is really designed uh, as a process to bring in more communities and even the communities that don't receive funding during this first round 
We hope to do multiple rounds as we go forwards, and then certainly to expand the learning so that um, that what people find out going through this process, what we all find out going through this process, is um, is shared equally around uh, the globe, but certainly around uh, around. Uh, Alaska, Hawaii, uh, other um, um, tribal uh, power systems, tribal communities, and, and remote power systems around the United States. Next slide. And so here I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Sean to talk a little bit more specifically about the solicitation itself. Um, please, uh, again, if you have questions as we go through here, be sure to drop them into the Q&A, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So thank you all. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, all right, so specifically on the CMAP solicitation, um, and you can go to the next slide, uh, please. There is, uh, again, the link was sent out. You should be able to access it. If you have any trouble accessing that site, um, please drop a chat, email us, uh, let us know. Um, but that should be out there. You can go out there. And uh, there's a number of different attachments at the towards the bottom of that web page that I would recommend everyone interested in this opportunity read through. One is going to be the solicitation itself. Obviously, very important to read through that. But the other one I would recommend is the um, scope of work that is one of the attachments. And within that document, there's a lot of details on the different topic areas. It goes into a little bit more detail than the solicitation itself. So would recommend um, taking some time reading through that. It's a, a um, again, we'll elaborate more on these topic areas that I'm going to talk about. Um, so the technical focus of this solicitation is, again, community-based microgrid energy systems designed to operate independently of the grid or isolate for prolonged periods of time. Um, there's four topic areas under this. And really, you can split these into two kind of broad levels. One is going to be regional microgrid communities, so multiple um, communities, larger systems. Um, and within that, there, uh, so three to five communities is what we're targeting. Um, within that, there's two areas of support. One is going to be for operations assistance. So that is going to be uh, intended to allow individual communities to complete um, detailed um, design and investment plans for either a new or a major retrofit of an existing microgrid power system. Um, so it is really looking to improve existing systems. Max award um, or the award amounts for that 200K base, um, 75,000 per community with a maximum award of 650K. And we expect those periods of performance to be about 24 months. Um, within that regional focus, the three to five communities, we do also have a topic area two, um, which is going to be focused on um, the development of new microgrids. So this topic area is intended to expand um, community-based microgrid development and planning, leading to the identification of regional approaches that are going to support the implementation of improved microgrids um, for or in multiple communities. Uh, funding levels for this, uh, 300K plus a 50K per community with a maximum award of 550K in similar timeline of 24 months. Now, topic areas three and four are for one specific community. So not the three to five. This is shifting to just individual communities, um, but similar uh, focus areas. So one uh, topic area three is for microgrid development. And so this is going to focus on um, new microgrids. It's intended to allow individual communities to complete detailed engineering and investment design plans um, for that new or major retrofit of an existing microgrid power system and helping to enable communities to obtain project funding. Maximum amount of award under this one is 300K and expected period of performance is 22 months. And then topic area four is um, intended to allow individual communities to assess design and also implement microgrid improvement efforts to operational microgrids. Uh, maximum funding here, 400K and expected period of performance is 18 months. Um, so looking at again, topic area one and topic area 
four. These are really um, aimed at improving the operation and maintenance of microgrids, either expanding capacity, um, for example, uh, improving the operation of it, could be improving the controls. And then topic area two and three are really for the development of new or expanding um, existing microgrids. Um, to be eligible for the solicitation, the microgrid, if primarily designed to be grid connected, is expected to operate independently of an external grid for long periods of time. And so next slide. Okay, the eligibility. Uh, so the map on the right is the eligible regions, and that is for this um, first uh, year effort under CMAP. There is a potential that this could expand in the future, but for this year in this round of funding, these are the eligible regions. Um, within these regions, eligible organizations are going to be nonprofit entities, including energy, uh, including energy co-ops, uh, state and local government entities as well as any federally recognized American Indian and Alaska Native tribes and villages, inclusive of any Alaska Native village or regional corporation as defined or established uh, pursuant to the Alaska Native Settlement Act. In addition to that, anyone applying must e either be from or directly representing specific underserved in indigenous communities in remote, rural, and islanded regions of Alaska, Hawaii, and tribal lands in the West and Midwest. And by West and Midwest, we mean these uh, blue highlighted states in the map. In addition to that, there is one other criteria for um, to meet the rural um, eligibility, and that is must identify at least one area in the U.S. with a population of not more than 10,000 using the 2020 Census Bureau figures that will benefit from the proposal. The identified area must either be a city or town or unincorporated municipality or census designated place or similarly discrete and identifiable communities that is not located within an incorporated municipality. So it could not be a community of less than 10,000 inside a urban center, for example. Um, and again, would encourage you to go out to the website, read through the solicitation and that scope of work, um, which really goes into some more details on the eligibility as well as the topic areas if you have any questions or use our Q&A here to ask those. And next slide. And so I'll turn it over to my colleague, Kendall Jackson, uh, for talking about the procurement and contract. Thanks, Sean. Um, my name is Kendall Jackson. I'm a subcontract administrator here at NREL, um, and you will see my um, information in the uh, RFP as well. Um, my email um, is all there. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so the RFP was posted to SAM.gov um, on October 7th, and the current due date is December 20th of this year. Um, again, it was posted to SAM.gov. I've had some questions come in about if it's on grants.gov. So um, SAM.gov is the only um, place that this is posted. Um, the solicitation number is there, um, RFX 2024-10032. Um, you'll find all the instructions for submitting. Um, these will come to my email address, which again is identified on um, the cover page, um, the requirements, the due date, all of those things will be um, identified in the RFP. Um, the goal is to have awardees selected in March um, to, and completed negotiations, completed subcontracts by summer of 2025. Um, if you have any questions regarding the RFP, those can be submitted to the email um, there on the slide, cmap nrel.gov. And answers will be provided to um, everyone um, that's looking at the solicitation on SAM.gov through an amendment. We actually posted the first amendment with questions last week. Um, and if more questions come in, we do plan to address those in future amendments as needed. Um, so then for the proposal review and selection. Um, so first uh, we go through what's called the best value selection, which takes into account both qualitative merit and price. 
So all of the merit criteria is laid out in the RFP as well. You'll see that they are weighted. Um, different criteria have different weight assigned to them. And then there's even some sub criteria so that you should have a good understanding of how your proposal is gonna be rated. Um, then once we receive the proposals, we go through the evaluation process, which includes um, just an initial review, making sure that we have all the requirements met um, in your proposal. Then uh, any all the proposals that move on from there will be evaluated against that merit criteria that I mentioned before and will be scored based on that. And then once we have um, our scores put together and um, decided on those that will be get, receiving an award, we then notify all of the successful offers as well as the unsuccessful offers. Um, and then from there, we go into negotiations um, in the goal of having an award granted. So you can go to the next slide. Um, as far as what's considered an allowable cost when proposing to NREL, um, I listed the FAR part there, 31.201-2, and that gives an explanation of what is considered allowable, reasonable, and allocable under the Federal Acquisitions Regulations um, and Department of Energy Regulations. Um, sometimes with our uh, subcontracts, we require price participation, but we just wanted to identify here that there is no price participation or cost share required for these. Um, looking into if property or equipment is proposed um, in your proposal, we just like to point out that anything that is defined as having a valuable life um, or a useful life or having value after the completion of the effort, um, just if NREL is paying for that equipment or property, uh, legally we do have we can claim ownership of that. Um, that's often not our goal is to keep ownership of it, but we just like to point out that legally, if if um, property or equipment is proposed on your proposal, um, legally NREL does have a right to it. Uh, specifying proprietary and restricted data. So you will, there is a an area where you can claim proprietary or restricted data within your proposal. Um, we just like to point out that that does go through a legal review, um, so just want you to be aware of that. And then um, another part of your proposal will be providing your acceptance or exceptions to the statement of work and NREL's terms and conditions, both general and intellectual property. Next slide. Uh, so the forms required through the solicitation. Um, these, again, in the RFP, there will be a link to all the forms as well as our terms and conditions. So you can read through all that and have access to all the forms that you need to complete. If you have any trouble finding those, um, feel free to email myself, um, Kendall Jackson at nrel.gov. Again, that's in the RFP, or you can even um, email the CMAP email too. Um, but we require the price cost proposal form. There is an organizational conflict of interest form. You will fill out one of those, um, either the representation or the disclosure. Um, once you go in and see what those are described as, um, you should know which one is appropriate, but you only need to submit one of those, whichever one um, is appropriate for you. If you've never worked with NREL, uh, new vendors do need to fill out a W-9 and an ACH banking form. And then the representations and certifications form, um, and part of that form, um, you have to fill in your information for the SAM.gov registration. I like to bring this up um, early on because SAM can take um, a while to get through their process to get registered. So if you're not already registered um, and you plan to propose, um, I would encourage you to register on SAM sooner than later. Um, and then one of the forms that is required for the uh, proposals is the sample deliverable schedule. So because these are firm fixed price subcontracts, um, successful offers will be paid for completed deliverables. And so within your proposal, you will have a schedule uh, outlining what you expect to be paid per deliverable. So you'll have your price cost proposal that outlines how you arrived at that cost, your total cost, but then you will break it down by deliverables in that attachment for when you submit. Um, and then lastly, uh, invoicing um, for any successful offers, 
Invoices will be based on those pre-negotiated values mentioned in that payment schedule that I just talked about. Um, and you will be paid um, based on the submission of completed and approved deliverables. And those will be submitted to our accounts payable department and all the instructions and the email and all of that um, would be in the subcontract. Um, but that is how um, payment will be made. So next slide. I think that was my last one. Yeah, thank you very much, Kendall. Mm -hmm. And um, we are going to move now into the Q&A portion of this webinar. So again, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please use that Q&A um, tab at the bottom. Uh, it's to the right of the chat and you can submit your questions there. We've been answering some as we go as well. Um, Kendall, I think I'm actually gonna start with a question for you since you just presented. Um, someone was asking if you could Talk a little bit more about the property disclosure. Uh, what does, they, they ask, why would NREL act as an owner when these are public grant funds that are being managed? Or could you just help clarify that a little bit? Um, because NREL is paying for it with um, NREL's funding, um, again, I haven't seen um, you know a subcontract where we came back and and ask for that property. We just like to give folks a head a heads up that legally we would be entitled to that property, um, but that often does not happen. We just like to be extra cautious in letting you know that that um, legally that is the case. Great, thank you, Kendall. I'm gonna read through a couple of the questions that we answered in the Q&A um, through through uh, text, but just for everyone's awareness. Um, so one of the questions was a microgrid system designed not to be independent of the existing energy grid, would that still be en eligible? And uh, unfortunately, no, that would not be. The microgrid is not designed to operate independently, then it would not be eligible. Um, similarly to that question, we had what is the minimum time off grid that a microgrid would have to be um, able to operate to be eligible? We uh, have not defined that, have not tried to define the minimum off time because it's really going to be application specific as well as the context. So what we would encourage you to do um, is uh, really... Uh, talk about express why the time off grid uh the off time grid off time is considered significant um we're looking to cover systems that are focused on community resilience so we're really thinking about days of independence not um hours um so again uh think about the justification there um and we will consider those on an application by application basis we did have another question similar to those. Um, this question was, our system could operate independently. However, it's more efficient to supply electrical energy to the existing community grid. Would that still be eligible? Ian, I'll let you respond to this one. I think you have through some of the other questions, but just to um, clarify. No, I'm happy to. So, um, so yes, I think that would qualify. Again, uh, within the solicitation, we've asked for this kind of operate with significant amounts of time um, independently. We understand that if you're connected to a grid, it's all it's always not always, but almost all the time um, more efficient to operate off the larger grid. So, if you're two communities that are connected by a um, a tie line or something of that nature, and you get your community from the other microgrid, but you have you have your own system that you can spin up if you need to um, during times of emergency, line failure, things of that nature. That is certainly eligible um, because, again, if you if you have the potential to operate for a significant amount of time uh, disconnected from the other system, uh, then you would fit this criteria. Um, what we're trying to avoid um, with this kind of significantly is a, an emergency system that might operate for an hour a year or something. So it's being built uh, at an industrial complex or something of that nature, and it's designed to give ultra high reliability power, um, but it's not designed to operate 
frequently at all. And so we're trying to, to kind of weed those types of systems out and really provide ones that, that support community benefit. So again, I would say, if you think you apply, it, um, then just work in, into your proposal about why you would have to operate or could have to operate independently from uh, the larger grid for uh, a, a long period of time and, and document that within your proposal. We have an, another question um, about uh, what is the overlap between the C2C uh, uh, microgrid learning cohort and what we're talking about here. Um, so from the partnership, not a whole lot. So the micro or the the microgrid C to C community learning that was um, that just closed, I think two weeks ago, is really kind of the entry part into this dialogue. And so uh, that is about a six month process uh, that will work through uh, what microgrids are, work with you uh, with your communities if you're selected. Um, but if you wanted to move forwards after um, that, that C to C co-learning um, cohort uh, into look at microgrids, then you would fit right into the microgrid partnership. So think of that um, as a boot camp. The C to C is a boot camp for microgrids. And then once you decide, if you decide that the microgrids are something that you're interested in pursuing from a community perspective, then, then starting to engage very actively in CMAP would make perfect sense. Yeah, in addition to that, I would say if there's anyone familiar with the ETIP program, uh, similarly, this would be a good follow-on opportunity after you've completed your ETIP technical assistance that we could get you um, further along in implementing a microgrid if that's something that you um, identified through your ETIP work. Uh, we had another question, only 13 states eligible. Uh, any more details on the selection of these? Uh, again, that map um, what is going to be illustrative of which states are eligible. Um, I do believe, uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, that um, it, that is the community has to be within those eligible regions. You could have an organization who might be located outside that the region, um, but as long as they re are representing a community, um, an eligible community within those regions, that would be okay. And, and going back to the to the reason, um, it's a little bit convoluted, but it but it actually comes from the original congressional language that started off this process a number of years ago. Um, where this is a pilot year, um, and so with this program going forwards, and and we certainly believe that it will. Uh, lots of interest within the Department of Energy Office of Electricity to kind of continue this going for multiple years. The expectation is we will expand it um, to other areas. Um, but there, there was some uh, original guidance um, and then uh, we didn't wanna open it up completely because uh, we, were, we were worried that we were gonna get a little bit too big for this first year. So uh, if this goes forward, the expectation is that we would, we would open it up to other regions of the United States but are, are limited to those states uh, at this point in time. So apologies to others uh, outside. Yeah, just to clarify Gail's question, which was, so participation is limited to federally recognized Western tribes in the blue region. That is correct. Yep. Uh, all right, we had uh, another question um, stating that the issue is the existing infrastructure. Uh, construction of a completely independent supply infrastructure would be cost prohibitive. Um, uh, don't believe, so we're, we're not saying that you would not be able to use existing distribution um, for your microgrid, but there would have to be hardware and controls in place to isolate that microgrid um, from the transmission and larger power system. I don't know if you want to expand on that, Ian. No, no, I think that I think that's fine. One one thing um, to kind of be clear about the size of the money, the grants that we're talking or the contracts that we're talking about here, not a lot of money. You're not going to build the microgrid systems um, with the resources that we have here, and so the the goal of this effort was really to help communities go from a conceptual design to a, a higher fidelity design that they could then go out and, and obtain other funding sources for, to, to allow community multiple communities to come together around a solution, whether that solution be around the operation and maintenance space, or about implementing 
um, microgrids or improving their microgrids in a similar way. So bringing communities together to, um, to engage around microgrid improvement. Or if you have a microgrid system that you know you, you want to do improvements on, um, but are having a hard time getting money to do that, you can, you, this fund is here to be able to do small scale improvements of microgrids. These, these kind of four topical areas we identified based on lots of dialogue um, uh, with the partners that, that we have mentioned through this project that have, have identified these kind of small gaps where there aren't other funding solutions that are out there. So um, the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration has lots of money out there for big power system development. So millions of dollars to be able to do stuff. They don't have grants out there um, for how do I design a power system? Um, and you need to have a power system designed before you can go and ask for $5 million or get a loan for $5 million or talk to anybody about actually the construction amount. So we've got a lot of programs um, through, the, through the government, uh, through the Department of Energy and state energy offices and stuff that kind of get you up to a point of this is what I want to do. And then there are some resources out there about now I know what I want to do. I want to, I want to pour concrete. I want to put things in. And there's a gap in there of how do we get communities, multiple communities to talk about this, and how do we um, how do we do this kind of more detailed engineering work? How do the communities do this more detailed engineering work to get from a conceptual design to a project that they can actually start seeking funding for? And that's really what, what CMAP, the CMAP solicitation is, is designed to engage around, is this, this gap between I've got an idea and I have a project defined that I'm now going to go out and get millions of dollars to fund. So it's really in this middle space here that we're really trying to, to focus the resources on. Great, thank you, Ian. I don't see any other questions coming into the, the Q&A. Give everyone just a few seconds here in case there are any more that you'd like to submit. And again, you may reach out um, to us via email as well if you have any more questions. Mariah, if you could put up the last slide again, just so that people can uh, take a, a snapshot of that. That's easy to do. Oh, and I do see, um, yep, someone submitted a question here. Let me just read through it real quick. And Ian, if you can as well. So to the to the anonymous one, uh, a long a long question there about um, uh, a community or an O and M solution for solar roofs to communities using airborne um, robotic drones, ostensibly um, for O and M of energy generation resiliency. So um, so conceptually, um, this would would fit in uh, the idea of how do we improve the operation maintenance, the, the efficiency of microgrid power systems. So conceptually, this is not, though, kind of a, a more on the R&D side. And the critical thing is that it needs to be community focused. So if you have an idea that you're developing, um, you would really need to find a community that was really to, to dive into this and work on it with you. And so if the proposal came in from the community engaging with you um, uh, for the solution to address the needs that they have within the community, then I don't see a, a, a problem with, um, with a proposal. But again, it's really community focused. So you have to have a partner with the system that you're trying to improve the efficiency of, not kind of a theoretical basis of would this, would this work or not. And we had an additional clarifying question on eligibility. Is this only for Native American tribes? Um, no, it is uh, for both Native American tribes and underserved communities. Um, again, the underserved would be any community with a population of not more than 10,000 using the 2020 Census Bureau figures. 
And again, the funding could go to a, a utility. So if you have an energy cooperative that's an independent entity that is working in, uh, has a microgrid in a, a tribal or an underserved community, it, it could be that that the, the um, energy cooperative is the one that applies for the resource. So it does not have to be a tribe that does it. Could also be an NGO. A not, uh, an, another non-governmental organization. All right, not seeing any others, but we'll give it another couple of seconds. And right now, uh, the slide being showed does have that QR code to bring you out to the CMAP website. Also has in the yellow text there our CMAP email address. Feel free to reach out and contact us there if you have any follow-up questions. Um, would just like to remind everyone that anyone that registered for this webinar, within about a week, once the recording is fully ready, uh, we have a couple steps we have to go through for that. Uh, we will be sending this out with some follow-up information. Um, you'll be able to access the recording, the slides, um, and we'll be posting the Q&A uh, with our responses as well. All right, I am not seeing anything else come through. So I think we can go ahead, Ian, and wrap up. Yeah, I think, and again, thank you again to all our veterans out there. Um, please follow up if you have any additional questions. Thank you for joining us today, everyone.